Hey, how are we today? What a church, eh? What a church. You guys can stay up here just for a few more seconds. What a church. How rich is this church? How deep is this church? How many layers has this church got? It's not, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's an exciting church, but it's also a deep church. How did you do that? Mark and Nina, how did you do that? How did that happen? It's, it's and we dropped, you know, uh, it's a musical term now. We dropped into this amazing thing just five minutes ago and the Spirit of God's still here. And uh, I'm just, I'm blown out by this place. Blown out by the worship. I, I thought John here was just a good looking guy. And uh, I was wondering, how come the photographer's just taking photos of you? Like, what do you, what do, you do when you get home? Does she download them and then just, you know, crop them? crop everyone else out but she's always over here she's never over there it's never over there there's no pictures of any of these guys it's just you I don't know I don't know what's going there you know <laughs> but you got a great voice I thought your voice I thought you're just there for looks for eye candy but but you know but you've actually got a great voice you know I'll just say this I, I'm not as sharp prophetically as my wife but I'll just say this about you and finances that God's going to really bless you you know I'll say that it's going to really bless you. And when He does, there'll be more, more than enough for you and your family that God will bless you in order to bless a generation of people. So I'll just say that, you know, it's great to be rich. You can prophesy riches, but, but you know, they're, they're not meant to be held. They're meant to flow through you. And, and, you know, the more generous you are, the more generous God will be with you. But I can, I can see you lacking nothing and you being a, a huge pipeline of blessing to a generation. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. And, and womanhood in this church. How strong is womanhood in this church, eh? Just, uh, it just, it's just in the place, isn't it? Anointed women of God. And I gotta say, Danielle, I gotta say, I've gotta say that that, that, that you know, you're like a Maserati that, that, is happy to go 10 kilometers an hour and then you can put your foot down and go 100 kilometers an hour within three seconds. I just think, I just think, honestly, I've got a Gucci bag. We're going to put you in the Gucci bag and take you back to the Gold Coast to be, you know, we're looking for a worship leader back on the Gold Coast. And it's a great place, the Gold Coast. I just, I think you're extraordinary. And this is, this is the word I have for you that, that um, you know, I just see you someone playing chess, you know. I'll add this, that, that blessed are those with a clean spirit. Your spirit's so clean. You know, I remember when, when I was at Sydney University with a mucky spirit and got saved and then I went to Emerald, Central Queensland and just, I cleansed my spirit thinking I'm the most boring person on planet Earth now, right? But we saw more people saved within two years. We had a three bedroom house with 12 people living there because of the amount of salvations that we saw and blessed are those who are pure in heart. They'll not just see God, but people will see God in you. I just think that, that you're in a game of chess here and, and you're patient, you know, patient with it. But, but God's the strategist. And you, and you might think, well, what have I achieved? What have I done? How much impact have I made? Hey, don't, don't even ask those questions. You're in the middle of a game of chess and God knows the next move, the next 10 moves. And there's, there's coming a checkmate. There's coming a destruction of the enemy simply through you and that's coming up in your life, in your world. And so just trust God that He knows the, the plan of attack. And it might seem like there is no attack, but I wanna to say to you right now, there's a huge plan of attack going on and God's strategizing your life right now and He's right on it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs> I was gonna, she's gonna be embarrassed, but is it Jade? Hello, how are you? I was surprised by, Ra is it Rachel? I was surprised by Rachel's voice too. I th I, Rachel sung and it was like Adele. I think, I'm thinking like, how does the spirit of Adele come upon Emerge Church? How did this happen? At the, like I'm expecting high, high voices and then this rich, deep voice comes out. It's extraordinary, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear you, Jade. You're just kind of like at the back there just kind of dancing around. But I did think there's leadership all over you. That's what I did think. 
And I did think, you know, when you're a leader, you tend to, and I'm not saying you are critical, but you tend to be a critic, right? And, and it's, it's not, it's just a byproduct of leadership because when you're a leader, you kind of know how things ought to be. And it creates a frustration. I, I want to say, I, sus, I suspect there's been a frustration in you, you know, in the different walks of life that you're in because you kind of know how things ought to be. But there'll come a time where God will raise you up. There'll come a time where you will be the leader and not the follower. There'll come a time where you will be the creator. You'll be the designer. You'll be the one with the blueprint. But this is the makings of you. Jade, it's the makings of you. And, and it's, I, you know, God takes a, quite a bit of time just making us, you know. But when God does raise you up like, like Joseph from prison to palace, oh, it's, for, it's for an extraordinary reason, an extraordinary season. That's coming up for your life, you know. So again, be patient. But, uh, but you know, the frustrations you have are, are just a byproduct of, of the gift of leadership. And I think God's saying celebrate the fact you've been given the gift of leadership and never become a slave. Never become a servant within your heart. Always realize you're a leader in the making and it'll frame everything about your life, realizing that one fact in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh-huh. Oh, so good. Okay, so you guys you guys can take your seats. Oh, uh, Taylor Swift, great to see you. You guys can take your seats and, and uh, fabulous. Great. So I, um, well, we've been back in Australia one year as of, let me think, today. One year today. And we were gone for, when you, when you, when you, when you sing that song, Lord, send me, you want to, you want to be, you want to, because we said, we sang that song 29 years later, we come back because we sang that song, send us. And uh, I, it's great to be back in the lucky country, in the land down under in the land, great south land of the Holy Spirit. They did a, uh, I love Australia. Australians are quite naughty, aren't they? That's why it's a police state because they're quite naughty and they, they just need instructions from the government, many instructions. In England, there's less instructions because people are less naughty. But, but the British people don't know who they actually are and they did a survey or oh, they did a, the, one of the big newspapers uh, asked the question, what does it mean to be British? Because no one quite knows what it means to be British. And someone wrote into the newspaper and said, being British is driving a German car to an Irish pub to drink a Belgian beer <laughs> and on the way home picking up a Turkish kebab to sit on Swedish furniture to watch an American TV show on a Japanese TV. <laughs> so I can see why the British are quite confused. But we're loving it, aren't we, Jen? We're loving being back uh, in Australia and love this church. Oh, gosh, honestly. I, 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 sometimes you, you, you're like a fish that's just been swimming in this place for quite some time, but to come into this place and just see a touch of heaven. And it's slightly under the radar, this church, but I, I wanna say that it's quite good to be slightly under the radar. The, the moment you are uh, above the radar, the moment you're on the radar, it just, it just sometimes, it ruins a good thing sometimes. You know, the people are getting saved in this church. There's, there's young people that have been risen in this church. Too much limelight when you're too young just kills you. You kind of die at 27, but you're buried at 87. You know, you, you want to mature nicely and there's something strong going on in this church, something powerful. And one day it'll be known and one day it'll be multiplied, but that's incidental. It'll be known for what's happening and what's happening in this place at this conference. That's what it'll be known for. And you want to enjoy the riches of it and get involved in it and, and, uh, and just saturate yourselves in the anointing of God and the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, I want to uh, talk about, you know, usually if you want to motivate a church, you tell people to get down off the grandstand and get onto the field, you know, you lazy so-and-sos, especially after COVID, you know, we just, all pastors have become mean machines, you know, you slackers staying at home watching online church. It's our fault because we bigged up online church a year ago and said, it's, it's the new thing, right? And now, now we're trying to switch it off, switch it off, switch it off, get people back into church life. But you know the, the the problem with that is is that it's it's not just it's not just spectator stand and field that's involved in a good game in the beautiful game that there's a small slither of land that exists between the field and the spectator stand and it's, it's called the bench 
And no great player has ever been consistently on the field without time out on the bench. And my word of wisdom for you right now is you're not on the shelf. God's never made a shelf in his life. You're on the bench. And some of you are thinking, well, I, I, no one's calling my name anymore. You know, call my name, call my name. No one's calling your name. There's a reason why no one's calling your name because it's only when you're on the field does your name get called. But when you hit the bench, you become nameless. But you don't become insignificant. You become invisible, but not insignificant. And some of you in your invisibility think, I'm on, I'm on the bench. I'm uh, sorry, in your invisibility think, I'm, I'm on the shelf. No one wants me anymore. I'm just going to die on the shelf. It's a lie from Satan. Because God doesn't do redundancies. God, God doesn't do retirement. God doesn't do has-beens. God only does will-bees. And so if stuff's been taken away from you, it's because God's prepping you for something bigger and something greater that's ever happened in the history of of your life. There's some people in this room that you need to stay on the bench a little bit longer because your number's not up yet. Some of you need to get off the field of striving and get back onto the bench. And some of you ought to come off the grandstand of cynicism and come back onto the bench of rest. And some of you ought to boot up. Because there's a lot of you here that are the star players of the next season of God for this generation. And, uh, and your, your number's flashing right now. And you don't recognize it because it's not a number seven anymore. Now it's a number 10 because God's reinvented you. And some of you in your, in your religion thinks, I want number seven. Give up on number seven. That's the previous you, but it's not the next you. God's reinventing you, giving you a brand new jersey for a brand new day, for a brand new season, for brand new successes. God's shifting things around within our lives. You need to boot back up again. Not every great player is on the field all at the same time. Some are resting, some are recovering, some are rethinking, reinventing, some are injured. Some are new to the premiership. But you can tell the future of a team, not by who's on the field. You tell the future of a team by who's on the bench. It's called depth of team. And the problem is we think either we're on the team or we're backslidden on the stands. But it's not true. Depth of team is what this church needs. It's what your church needs, a depth of team. Not everybody's playing at the same time. I remember 10 years ago where England never, never seems to win a major championship. But 10 years ago, David Beckham was injured and, uh, and he, was, he, was, he was on the bench. He wasn't on the spectator stand. He wasn't in the commentary box. He wasn't in a onesie back at home he was on the bench Beckham was on the bench and because Beckham was on the bench it meant the rest of the team must have been an awesome team to have such a great depth of team and there's a bunch of people in this room right now that are like Beckham's on the bench people young and old who have been in the field of conflict Spiritual conflict, relational conflict, emotional conflict, some physical conflict. You've been in the arena of Goliath slaying. Forerunners of the game. You've been recovering, resting. You've completed a season. Completed an innings. You completed a tour of duty. And the first thing that I want to say to you is thank you. And just because you're not on the field doesn't mean you're not part of the team. Stop backing out of team, of, this, of the team. Stop backing off. 
You're a part of this team. Stop flicking your inferiority complex, your rejection complex. This is your church. It'll be forever your church. Stop flicking in and out of your church. You're on the team because God's placed you on the team. And the team is field and bench. Bench and field, field and bench, bench and field. That's the rhythm of a great church. It's not field, then field, then field, then field. It's field, then bench, then bench, then field. That's the rhythm of a great church. Psalm 134 talks about you. It says, those who minister by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands and bless the Lord. Manchester United isn't great because of Ronaldo or Sancho. It's great because of Matt Busby, Bobby Charlton, and George Best. A great team is a deep team where talent, history, experience, and wisdom gather on the weather-beaten slats of the bench. Secondly, I want to say, the game's not over until the fat angel sings. (laughs) And I ain't heard no fat angel sing. The end of a season is not the end of a journey. And when Jesus said it's finished, it wasn't finished. His tour of duty was finished, but his ministry wasn't finished. For the last 2,000 years since he left planet Earth, he's been making intercession, lifting up his blood-stained hands for you, working heaven on your behalf. And so he'd finished a season, but he hadn't finished his livelihood. And it's the same for you, that you finished a season. And what you are in now is what I call an ad break. And you know about that in Australia because there's ad breaks every five flipping minutes on your television stations telling me to bet on another betting online thing. I want to bet a lot now I'm back in Australia. It's an ad break. It's the page between chapters. Just because it's a blank page doesn't mean that's the end of the book. Some of you are misinterpreting the times. It's just a blank page in between chapters. You're in between chapter 9 and chapter 10. It's not over. It might feel like no one's calling your name, but it doesn't matter because God has your name etched on the palm of His hands. So it doesn't matter about other people. What matters is that God remembers your name. God's not finished with you. You may feel like you're on the shelf, that you used to be the star player, the life of the party, the one that everyone wanted for their team. You used to have a bunch of friends, you did everything together. You used to be in a relationship that despite your best efforts, slowly grew cold and distant, it died in your hands. It's not the end, it's an ad break, it's a pinch. Because God makes benches. This is your God. It's your opportunity to recover, get reinvented, get recharged. Because the greatest season in your life is about to begin. Life was never as good as you make it out to have been. It's, it's the problem with us. We think, we think everything was better yesterday. We think music was better, you know, back in the 90s. And that. Have you listened to the Spice Girls? They're terrible. <laughs> but we romanticize the past. Do you know, for every one of your past, you've been a square peg in a round hole. That's how you've been. Your entire past, you've been misshaped. 
And part of the reason why you're being misshaped is because God creates character out of misshape. When you're uncomfortable, when you're squeezed into the wrong position, when you're in the wrong kind of job, when people want you to be something that you're not, it just takes you beyond yourself. And that's where characters develop. We get that, but don't be fooled. Don't romanticize the past. Your past is full, filled with pain because pain produces character and character produces completeness and it gets you ready for the greatest days. But God's intention isn't to forever make you a square peg in a round hole. God's intention is to maximize your pizzazz, maximize your charisma. And eventually, once you've got character to make you a round peg in a round hole, your future is more exciting, more dynamic, more fitting than anything that's ever happened in your past. So stop regretting past relationships. Stop regretting past appointments. God's removed them because He's getting you ready for the best years of your entire life. Can anybody say amen? amen. <laughs> Psalm 138 verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. For the love of the Lord endures forever. Philippians 1 verse 9 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you shall be faithful to complete it. He's not going to abandon you mid-race. Other people may be doing what you used to do. You used to be number seven. Somebody else has got your jersey. Other people may be spending time late into the night with the same people you used to burn the midnight oil with. I've got two words for you. First word is move. Second word is on. I'm going to string them together. <laughs> move on! Because you're a broken record. Because you're complaining that that used to be me. Yes, not you anymore. Because God's moved you on for something better and bigger and brighter than you've ever seen in your entire life. Stop hanging on to smallness. Stop hanging on to history. Because God wants you to move on. And sometimes God removes past securities in order to force you to either freeze or to move on into your God-given future. Here's a great scripture, it's 1 Samuel 16, 1. And this is after Saul had led everybody down through his idol worship. And Samuel was the prophet, and then the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul since I've rejected him as king? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. He's saying it's time to anoint the next king. Stop crying. Wipe your tears away. Stop mourning. Do not dwell on the past, for I am doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wasteland, streams in the desert. Get with the program. God said to Samuel, He said, Anoint your horn with oil. Anoint the future moves of God. Anoint the next you. And I'll say to every one of you here, the next you is the next big thing. You're waiting for the next big thing, but the next big thing is the next you. And you've got to move on. You've got to let go. You've got to have the Elsa anointing <laughs> to let it go and to take a hold of the next move of the Spirit of God. God's giving you the oil of joy for morning. God's refilling your jars full of oil because you're coming in to a new season. Stop crying over spilt milk. The thing about spilt milk is once it's spilt, you can't, you can't, once it's under the refrigerator, just let it dry out. There's no point putting a tea towel underneath it. There's no point trying to suck it in with a straw. It's, it's finished with, it's gone now. And just let spilt milk, just let it, let it simply dry out. She's not worth it. He's not worth it. It's not worth it. Because they're the past, they're dead to you right now. And they're the past. And it's not because you're ugly, it's not because you're uncoordinated, it's not because you're useless, it's not because you're rejected, it's not because you're abandoned, it's not because of your history, it's not because of your dad, it's not because you were born on the wrong side of the tracks, it's because of God. God is stitching this thing together. 
in order to split you from your history because he's got a bigger future for you. And unless you stop dwelling upon the past, then God can never give you the future. Stop blaming the devil that the devil took. God uses the devil. And if God allows the devil to do various things, then the sovereign God has used the devil for his purposes of releasing you into the next season within your world. Life's rejections are God's ejections into your future. So there's, all, there's people in this room and, and you know, I'd hesitate to, to want, kind of say this in my church because I'm wanting to, you know, jig everyone up a bit. There's some people here in this church that you're clogging up the pitch. You're all wineskins. You, you passed your sell-by date. You're annoying us. Let's just put it that way. You just, you're not nice to be around. You're itchy, scratchy, always complaining, always whinging. Just moody. You're a moody cow. Just, it's just, I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm prophesying, right? But I just, I just think that if you're not fresh, then maybe it's time for the bench. Because you're striving, because your identity is in your position. Your identity is in what you're doing. But you bring misery and you bring pain everywhere you go. But the, the bench is a place of refreshing. The bench is a place of renewal. And the bench, you're still on the team. It's just the bench is the place where you actually challenge your insecurity. And you challenge your performance drivenness. And you challenge your, 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 your successness. And you step back onto the bench and then God reinvents you for a bigger future. For some of you, it's time for a Sabbath day's rest. You've lost your spark. You've lost your vad vad voom. You've lost your pizzazz. You've lost your mojo. You know who you are. We know who you are. It's time for a Sabbath day's rest. If you can allow this season to end, you can allow the new season to begin. How good's this message, by the way? No, it is a, it's a great, it's a profound message, this. Should be taking notes, but it's too late now. Don't even start. I'm trying to land this plane right now. If you can allow this season to end, you can allow the new one to begin. If you can release your identity from what you do and who you've been hanging around with back to whose you are, who made you, we're in business. It's time for another hit record. Uh-huh. I don't want to be in a band called Chumbawamba. I don't want to be part of the Baha men. First single, who let the dogs out? Second single, who let the cats out? That's gone. I want to be a legend. I want to be a Chris Martin. I want to have a, a, a fix you record. I want to have a, the scientist. I want to have a sky full of stars. I want to have hit after hit after hit after hit. But I've got to make sure my next hit's not the same as the last hit. Otherwise, that'll be the end of me. And some of you ought to have a vision to become legends in the land, not one hit wonders in the land. Because God wants you to get bigger and better and brighter every season from this season on. How about the, the keyboard player coming up? It says in John 15 too, it says, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Hate that. But then it says, so it'll be even more fruitful. Lay it down. Change your Facebook status back to, from, back from what you do to who you are. Some of you change your status back to single because you're going out with the wrong person. How many words of knowledge am I getting today? I mean, it's, it's only in the morning. Normally, normally this happens at night time, but I'm, I'm just flowing, aren't I? I'm just flowing. Everybody knows someone that that word was for, don't they? You know who I'm talking about, don't you? 
you know exactly there's probably three couples here that should not be together. You know about it. It's going to take a courageous decision in approximately five and a half minutes' time. But I'll disguise it. I'll let other people come to the altar so you won't exactly know who's who, but you'll guess. It says in John 12, 24, unless a grain of wheat dies, it abides alone. Think about it. Unless a grain of wheat dies, unless you die, unless you get used to death, you'll abide alone. But if you can die, then you'll kickstart a chain reaction. And it'll be a part of one of the greatest harvests your world has ever seen. Let me finish off and say to everybody on an ad break, beware of the grandstand, the looming shadow of cynicism that falls easily upon inactivity and insecurity. Never say about the church that it used to be better than it is now because you're lying. You're romanticizing. You've got rose-tinted glasses on. These are good days for the church. This room is filled with every, every treasure that I absolutely treasure. It's in this room right now. It's, it's a remarkable set of circumstances that you're custodians of. But you know, when you're on the grandstand and you're cynical, you, when you used to be the star player, you used to be the worship leader, you used to be the elder, the chief steward, the one who serves the coffee, now someone else is taking your place. Well, that's because obviously it was about you, wasn't it? You see why God took you off being a worship leader. I can see why God took you off leadership. Because the proof in the pudding is when He takes you off, how do you feel about it? And if it is all about you now, it was all about you then. And this has to be about community. It has to be about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got a chance to, to be like a grain of wheat and allow yourself to die. Stop hanging around negative people, clogging up the field with doubt and pessimism. Stop going off in a huff, picking up your ball and taking it with you. Oh, I hate that. It's so annoying. Stop parking your backside on the plastic bucket seats of the stands. Stop being naughty. Slap yourself. Because we can't slap you by law. We want to slap you but we don't want to go to jail. (laughs) Do us a favor, slap yourself. (laughs) Here's my lastly, lastly. It's not the quality of the bench that makes a great team. It's the attitude of the bench. So when England was losing as they often do in major tournaments David Beckham was standing there he wasn't in a tracksuit he was in a Marnie Yves Saint Laurent <laughs> he's dressed to the nines and some of you here today could do with a shave you could do with buying some new clothes you could do with dressing yourself up stop looking miserable in the way you appear. Because your appearances are prophetic, you know. That's why after you have a shower, life's a lot better after a shower. And yet, what's a shower doing? Hardly anything, you're not that dirty. Some of you are, but most of you aren't that dirty, right? So what is is having a shower? It's just prophesies freshness. And you should work everything in your possession, your physicality, your emotionality, your environment, everything for the forward advancement of your attitude. You want to bench it like Beckham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The problem we've got is we think the camera follows the star players on the field, but God's camera's not there. It's easy to be the star player. 
because all momentum's behind. Everyone's calling your name. But what happens when nobody's calling your name? Well, God's interested in that because God's camera is on the invisible right now. And you think, oh, it's on the guy who's scoring goals. No, it's not. God's camera's on you on the bench thinking, was it all about you? Or is this about the team? Because you might not be able to be high function, but you can be high family. No one's redundant in this. I know when my wife, when she used to run, do track and field and run around the track and, and sometimes like a dad had, had a completely bald head and sometimes he'd turn up at the track events and in the grandstand she'd have a look and she'd see this, the sun shining off the bald head and she'd think, my dad's here, she'd go a little bit faster. That's how it is with a good bench. A bench that's not looking at their navel, thinking, what about me? But a bench that gets, gets behind the Daniels, that gets behind the Taylor Swift standing over there, that gets, gets behind the Jono here, that gets behind the Rachel there. Where are you? Because all of these young people need an auntie. But where are you? Sulking that you used to look great like these guys. Well, give these guys three kids. They're gonna look pretty similar to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it just happens to everyone. <laughs> you stop being so jealous. You know, with Jono here, the whole world's in front of him. The problem when you turn 40 is you think, there's Jono, I used to be like Jono till all my dreams collapsed. Yeah, that's your problem. Is your dreams wouldn't have collapsed if you celebrated Jono. Because that is your dream. Yes, that's your dream, to lift up the next generation. That's your dream. Slap yourself. The dream is to be a deliverer for a nation. None of you are handicapped in this. All of you can stand up on the bench because every boy needs a dad. Every sister needs a mom. Everybody needs an uncle. And there's room in this church, not just for quality players, but for, added, for, for true family players. And if you add capacity and aptitude with family, a culture of love, we've got ourselves one of the most genius combinations this world has ever seen. I'm going to have an altar call. It's going to be really quick, right? I've got some books. This is Jen's book, Prophesy. It's 84 daily devotionals, straight from her devotionals. I'm, I'm in awe of her devotionals. If I get a word from God, I don't tell it to Jen because I feel like it's not much compared to her words. <laughs> This is her book, She Is, which is uh, for coffee tables. And it's just, it's a beautiful, incredible book. In actual fact, on one of the pages in it, halfway through the book, there's a skyline of Gold Coast in it. And it says words uh, prophesying over the Gold Coast that your darkest season will be your lightest time. And this is five years before we arrived on the Gold Coast. It's, it's in the book. It's incredible. This is my book, The Hit Factory. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's who's the most, who's the, who's the greatest person outside of Jesus in the New Testament? Everyone says Paul because he wrote half of the New Testament. It's not Paul, it's Barnabas. If there wasn't a Barnabas, there would be no Paul. Barnabas created a hit factory and it pulled Paul in off the streets and reinvented him for the greatest time in his life. I'd rather be a Barnabas than a Paul. And this is all about the spirit of Barnabas. I've got my book, Man Boobs and Other Human Rights. <laughs> Cut my book. If you think you can, that's from Henry Ford. If you think you can or think you can't, you're both right. It's about changing the way you think. Think twice. Is uh, it, This has 500 nuggets of truth in it. It's a brilliant book. This is our diary. Jen and I did a diary for the first 15 years in England, and this is called Up the Creek Without a Paddle, which is a good description of our time over there. And it's filled with tragedy and miracles. This is my book, Sacred Cows Make Great Barbecues. And this is my most popular book, Jesus Saved Me From Your Followers. 
you can get them afterwards. So there's this guy called Roy Riggles, right? And uh, he was in the Rose Bowl final, uh, gridiron, American football. And, uh, and when he got the ball, this is like back in the turn of the last century. And he got the ball and he started running with it, thinking I'm going to be an absolute hero today because, because I'm running with it. No one's trying to stop me, right? And it was, he, he ran 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, 50. And it, it was weird when he ran about 50 yards. He's thinking, gosh, this is, easy, this is easier than I've ever had in my whole, in my whole career. No one's even trying to tackle me, right? It's because he's running the wrong way, right? But, but <laughs> no one's trying to tackle him. And then eventually, you know, after 60 yards, he gets tackled by one of his own team. <laughs> and he's just, he's just embarrassed by it. And so he, and then half time comes along or whatever, and he goes in and he's crying his eyes out. You know, feels totally dejected. Feels like his life's a complete mess. And feels useless. And, and, uh, and then the coach starts to prime up the team and the guy comes in and says, hey, everyone go out for the second half. And, and the coach, his name was Coach Price, said, okay, exactly the same team second half as first half. And Roy Riggle said, well, I'm not going out there. And he couldn't convince him. And, and he thought, I'm just going to have to leave Roy here. And he just got one word of inspiration that I'm going to give you today. He just said, he said, Roy, the game's only half over. Roy's back start to straighten up a little bit because he starts thinking the game's only half over. I still got half a game to go. The next day, the newspapers said that Roy Riggles played like a man possessed by a demon in the second half. Couldn't stop him. He was everywhere. He's like a gazelle. He was like a meerkat. <laughs> he was just everywhere, all over the field because he realised the game's only half over. Say that to each one of you. It's halfway point. Halfway point. Put your failure aside. Put the old aside. Put your history aside. And come back in your heart, in your mind, in your soul to be a part of the greatest game, the most beautiful game this world's ever seen. I'm going to have an altar. And this altar's for two types of people. It's really, it, it, is, it is a frozen altar, like an Elsa altar. It's a letting go. That's what it is, right? Just to let you know. It's a surrender altar. But how do you get into the kingdom? You get into the kingdom through repentance, which is surrender, and faith, which is new believing. And so it's a kingdom altar there. But it's for people who... I'm, you're thinking, Dave, this is a great message and I'm now going to actually apply it by coming off the coke-stained bucket seats of the stand and coming back onto the bench. And there's other people here that you think that you're on the shelf. You need to slide off the shelf at this altar and slide back onto the bench. The moment you hit the altar... You're now back in the team. And it makes no difference to you whether you're scoring goals like Daniela or whether you are an auntie, a mother, a sister, or a daughter. Benching it like Beckham. Because we're all one here. And this is the way the kingdom operates. It's field and bench, bench and field, that makes up the entire team emerge. So have a think about it, right? Because straight when we stand up, I'll give you, I'll give you 10 seconds because I'm kind. It's called an altar. If you want to know anything about the Bible, God only sets fire to altars. He never sets fire to stands. He sets fire to altars. And what you need is the fire of God. You've tried to rejig your passion. Think, I need to get passionate for God. It's, it's, it's really difficult just to try and get passionate. It's like I'm trying to get hungry for God. Either you are or you aren't. But God can supernaturally come upon you to give you a passion for the kingdom of God. You've lost your passion. Yeah, fair enough. We all do from time to time. Maybe your answer is this altar. It's going to happen in about 55 seconds time calm down. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. This could change your life. 
This is you slapping yourself. This is you prophesying over yourself. You don't need a prophecy now. This is you prophesying over yourself. Yeah, come on, let's get this together. This is what I need.